Well, good morning. Special welcome, any first time guests, either live stream or here with us. Grateful for you. If the elements start to bother you at all, sun, allergies, there's a live streaming going on inside the church for 50 people. So if you need that, feel free to go in. I'd like to do a welcome to our, our youth summer intern, Logan Harney. Are you here, Logan? Stand up, brother. Nice. He's going to be spending time with the elders in different areas of really locking in and his desire uh, to be in ministry. And so this is a great opportunity. Um, so we're, we're excited. If you'd be praying for Logan all summer and just encourage him. Then this afternoon, there's going to be a wedding for Drake Langer and Mackenzie Kissman. I believe they're all at home getting ready. So are anyone here from the family? Okay, we'll be, be praying for them. It's going to be a special uh, day. We're studying through Paul's epistle to Romans. We've been at it for six months. And this morning we begin an amazing section from Romans 3.21 to verse 31. If you want to turn to Romans chapter 3, I call this the but now section. Some amazing things have been said about this portion of Scripture that we are now going to take up. Martin Luther said this paragraph is the chief point in the very central place of the epistle and the whole Bible. One commentator named Cranfield said these words give us insight into the innermost meaning of the cross. John Piper said, what is the most important paragraph in the Bible? This passage is the very heart of the Gospel and lays bare the heart of God like few other texts in our Scriptures. All the beauties of the Reformation are found here. The truths that we stand on as a church, that we are saved by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, by the work of Jesus Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, will all be found in this section. And so I'm praying for you and expecting mighty things from God as we gaze at these truths that are in these paragraphs for the next months. This is the hope and the remedy of sin for all people. Please don't settle for just mental assent to these truths. The devil mentally assents to these truths. But I want you to seek and study and meditate and pray that you see the glory of God in the face of Christ in this chapter. Emanating from every verse, every tense, every word and every connection, you'll just see the glory of God in Christ. Every angle I've been looking at, there's just glory on every turn. I pray that my own face is shining from the glory that I saw this week in the Scriptures. They are designed to take your heart, your life, your soul, and your all. They're to be the center reference point of your life from here on. They give salvation and they make you holy. And they will bring you to glory with God for all of eternity. These words are to give life. And so it's only fitting then that we would begin in prayer because what I desire for you in this section, only the Holy Spirit of God can do through His Word. And I want to begin with asking Him to do that in our midst. Father God, we come confidently and boldly before Your throne of grace. And God, we do. We stare into the center and the glory and the beauty of the cross of Jesus Christ and the, the heart of our God. And I pray that Your Spirit would take these words and illuminate them into every mind and heart. God, let everyone in this place be born from above. Let no one be satisfied with dead external religion, just knowing doctrines that haven't made them alive in Christ. And so Lord, You are the only one who can do that, and we ask that You would do mighty things in our midst. I pray that the saints of God would be so blessed and encouraged again in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, let us have hearts that burn for you and for you alone. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Paul introduced us to the theme of his letter in Romans 1.16. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed 
from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And then Paul began in chapter 1, 18, all the way to 3.20 to show us that, that we're all under the condemnation of God. Because when Adam fell, we've been born now with his, his record and a bad heart. And Paul has been showing us that. Whether you're moral, uh, uh, immoral, rejecters of God, or if you're moral and you're God-professing, he said, none are better. We're all under condemnation. It's the only religion that says that. There's the, there's, you're not better off for being moral or immoral. You're all in the exact same condition before God. And the conclusion last week is that the law is not the pathway to get right with God in verses 19 through 20, which is really radical in our day and age. Because the number one way that people, when they want to find God and they start trying to find Him, they look to their works. They start saying, I'm going to be a better person and go to church. And so we always run to the law to try to get ourselves right with God. And God is saying, that is not my design. That's not my gospel. It's the opposite way of finding God. The law was given, Paul said in verse 20, to show you your sin and to make it exceedingly sinful that you need to be right with God. You're transgressing God. And in our fallenness, we, we try to take the law and get right with God by obeying it. Paul said every mouth needs to be silenced. We need to be shut before God with any merit, any arguments, any hope of anything in us. If the Bible ended here, it'd be like every other religion. That's bad news. There's, there'd be no hope in this section. The goal of this passage of Scripture was to take away any hope in anything but God. And this morning we moved to a new section in verse 21. But now, but now, something amazing that we're going to look at today. The key to this section, six times, two verbs and another adjective, is the righteousness of God. He's righteous. He requires perfect righteousness to be in His presence. And we have none. And we can't get any on our own. This section is now going to begin to answer that problem Amazingly. And so what we need is the wisdom of God. How can God justify, declare that we're righteous when we're unrighteous and still be a just God, not violate His character? How can He do it in a way that He gets all the glory? My glory I will not give to another. There needs to be a gospel that all glory goes to God. And I pray that we will answer that then in the weeks ahead. I want to give you your outline that we will travel in this season. <clears throat> We're going to look at eight elements of the righteousness that God imparts to the believer. In verse 21 this morning, we'll see there's a righteousness that's been revealed. And then we'll see also that it's a righteousness that comes by faith. Then thirdly, it's a righteousness that's necessary for all. Fourthly, it's, it's a righteousness that can make us acceptable to God. Fifthly, it's a righteousness that vindicates the righteousness of God. Six, it's a righteousness that will exclude all boasting. It's a righteousness for all, not just for the Jew. And it's a righteousness that will establish the law and lift it to its highest place that it could be lifted. So let's begin with our first point. It's a righteousness that's been revealed in verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. And I just want you to listen to those words as they ring out from the pit that we have been brought into in the last three chapters. When I looked to myself, the but now was, okay, but now just die and be condemned, Ken Murphy. But now you have no hope. But now your mouth is shut. But now comes the judgment of God forever. But wait, that is not what these words are saying. But now has become pure gold to my heart and my soul. It's the hinge that our whole hope of salvation sits on. You've been boxed in to an inescapable corner of God's wrath. 
And Paul's now going to open a window of divine grace and let the light of salvation of Christ now shine into our hearts. Wesley said, Lone my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed Thee. That is the reality of the but now. I'm praying that some dungeons this morning might flame with light. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested in Christ. All there was was despair and desperation. But now, God came into the world in the form of His Son. God came and lived the life that we should have and God required. He died the death that our sins deserved and He was buried and He was raised unto life and victory for all now who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has changed everything. We rejected God despite general revelation of a creation. He gave us over to our sins that we would just drown in them. You don't want me, you want sin? Okay, have it. You're going to drown, you're going to drink it up. Iniquity. You're under His wrath. What hope is there? But now, we have the Word of God and we preach it and we teach it and we tell everybody else how to live and we condemn Gentiles. We don't do what it says. We're hypocrites. What hope is there for a hypocrite? But now, I see that God requires a perfect righteousness to be in His presence. And He says there's none righteous, not even one. What hope do I have? But now, the law has shown me that that Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. My mouth is just shut before God. But now, but now is the hope that we'll begin to look at. And I want to introduce our section by going back again to Martin Luther and the Reformation. (coughs) Luther was a professor of biblical theology theology at Wittenberg, the Roman Catholic Church. And he's taught the Psalms, then he went to Galatians, and Hebrews, and then Romans. And while he was in Romans, he said, I had a burning desire to understand what Paul meant in Romans 1, that the righteousness of God is revealed. I hated the word, the righteousness of God, said Luther, which by the use and custom of all my teachers, I had been taught to understand it philosophically as referring to the formal act of justice, as they call it, that is, by the justice that God is just, by which He will punish sinners. And so, God is just. Luther saw the righteousness of God as God's justice to punish sinners for their sin. And so Luther said, I love God, I hated Him. Because the more I tried to be righteous, the more I realized I couldn't attain this standard and God had this perfect standard that I could never attain to. I hated it. I hated it. All it did is it was going to bring me under wrath and judgment for all of eternity. And Luther says, I meditated night and day on those words until at last, by the mercy of God, I paid attention to the context. That's good advice. The righteous person, he said, lives by faith. And I began to understand that in this verse, the righteousness of God is that by which the just person lives by a gift of God that is by faith. And I began to understand that this verse means the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel. The righteousness that is revealed, he said, he finally caught on. It's a passive righteousness. It's not a righteousness that I go and perform. It's a righteousness that's given to me. It is by which the merciful God justifies us. He declares you right with Him. Righteous By faith. That's why he said the just shall live by faith. So do you see the righteousness that Luther had grown to hate was Romans 1-3. through 
He hated a perfect righteousness that no one can keep. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested. And it comes from God as a gift to be received from God by faith and by faith alone. A righteousness that declares people not guilty. A righteousness that will make you stand before God justified as you sit in your seats or grass here this morning. This righteousness is given as an act of God's mercy and not as an act of God's judgment. Luther said all at once, I felt that I had been born again and entered into Paris, paradise itself through open gates. Boom. And I exalted in this word the righteousness of God to where I loved it as much now as I hated it with hate before. And I stand on the testimony of this man and declare before you this morning that this phrase, the righteousness of God, for me was the very gate of paradise. And I pray if any gate needs to be opened this morning, that this would finally break in and land on your heart. I pray that the gate would be open to every heart hearing my voice. And so let's dig in and look at what this is. The righteousness of God revealed in verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The subject here is righteousness. What kind of righteousness are we talking about? It's of God righteousness. It's what's called a subjective genitive. It means that God is the the subject or the source of the idea. The righteousness of God, then, it means He is the source of the righteousness. And so translating it would be a God kind of righteousness has been revealed. The righteousness that God requires, He's manifested it. And He gives it to us now in His Son. If I'm ever going to measure up to the divine standard of God, a divine righteousness must be given to me. You have to have your mouth shut. You can't give a perfect righteousness that God wants. So God in His grace gives it. He gives it to you. This is why Luther insisted that the righteousness in which we are justified is a righteousness that is extra nos outside of. It's it's imputed to us. It's, It's an alien righteousness. It's not your own. It's from God. But now, it's been manifested. And so here's what I want you to get. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested. What? Was it not manifested before? Of course it was. The law manifested the righteousness of God. So did the whole Old Testament. You read your Old Testament, righteousness of God from cover to cover. The righteousness of God has been manifested. But now, at this time, this day and age that we live in, It's been manifested in a way that it was not manifested before. The main verb here has been manifested. It means to become visible or revealed. It's become visible. You can can see it. It's, It's been revealed by God. How has it been revealed? For 1,500 years, God spoke through types and shadows and prophecies and histories. But now... 33 years, He manifested His righteousness in His Son who came to this earth and lived on it and walked on it. He did it publicly for all to see. So the answer is, how did He do it? The Christ event. Christ was born. He fulfilled the law. He died under its penalty. Buried and raised, seated in the victory of God now at His right hand. This Righteousness was revealed. And it's not so much to show you your sin as to save you from your sin. But now we live in the time of the manifestation of God's righteousness like no other time or place in the history of the world. The one who perfectly manifested the righteousness of God, His own Son. I stand amazed 
at how God manifested his righteousness to us. We read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see a God kind of righteousness revealed. Read those Gospels and marvel at righteousness right before your eyes. Perfect. Beautiful. I see a divine standard perfectly met and lived out in His Son. Christ who loved God with all of His heart, mind, soul, and strength every second of the day and His neighbor as His own self. I just love reading and seeing righteousness. This is my Son and who I am well pleased, said God the Father. What beauty has been manifested to this world. A righteousness. But what good does all that beauty do for me? I can't attain to that standard for sure. I look at Jesus and I'm even worse off than the law. I'm doubly condemned. If that's righteousness, I'm done. Take me to the Sermon on the Mount. Be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. I'm finished. Please don't miss the beauty of this gospel. This, this phrase, the righteousness of God, has two bookends in our verse 21. The first one is apart from the law. There's a discontinuity it, apart from the law. We're going to see that that ended. And now it's being witnessed by the law and the prophets. There's a continuity through all of Scripture that this has always been God's plan. <coughs> Let's look first. This righteousness is revealed apart from the law. A God kind of righteousness was revealed Apart from it, the context here, verses 19 through 20, no flesh will ever be justified by keeping the law of Moses. Morality. So this is really big. Galatians 3, we're told by the Holy Spirit and Paul that the law was a tutor. And it was given for a season and for a reason. And it was to manifest the righteousness of God. And it was to show you you're unrighteous and to show you transgression. And that tutor was to lead you to the righteousness we're talking about this morning. Because you'll realize I have none. I can't get it. I can't perform it. I need another one. And you come to Jesus Christ for righteousness. That's what the law was given for. And Paul says it's done. It served its purpose in history. In Hebrews, it says it's ready to disappear, that old covenant. I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So get this. There's a saving righteousness being revealed here. Not through Mosaic law. Do this and live. But through Jesus Christ. It's a new era. Love, but now. <laughs> There's a way to be right with God. To be perfectly righteous apart from the works of the law. Apart from the Mosaic economy, not joining a nation, being circumcised, keeping their laws and ceremonies. There's another way. There's a new covenant. There's a new order. A new way of righteousness of God being revealed. Apart from the works of the law. This is the best news to any mouth that has been shut in Romans 1-3. through I'm not righteous and I never could be by my works. But now, there's a God kind of righteousness revealed that I can have apart from the works of the law. Best news ever. I feel hope coming back into my heart after the last six months. There's a way to be right with God. And it's an alien righteousness that comes to me by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, on the other end, it was witnessed by the law and the prophets. The Old Testament anticipated this event. This but now, he's been pointing to and telling us for all of the, the Bible that it's coming. I flip back to Romans 1.1. 1, 1. <coughs> Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called his apostles, set apart for the gospel of God. What gospel? The gospel that was promised beforehand to the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. This gospel has been promised and told. There, there's a righteousness coming from all of history. A God kind of righteousness was revealed apart from the law. Being witnessed by the prophets. 
The significance of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a new order, a new kind of righteousness. And here's what I want you to understand. This is not an afterthought. It's not plan B. This is God's plan before He even created the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. This is the heart and plan of God before He spoke all this into being. This is why all of this exists. For the glory of God and being just and justifying the ungodly sinner. Genesis 12, 3, God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, gift given to him. Galatians 3, 16, now the promises were spoken to Abraham, New Testament, and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. Abraham, I'll bless the nations through your singular seed, Jesus Christ. They'll receive a righteousness not their own, but this one being manifested that Paul's talking about. He gives a ceremonial law that showed there would need to be a perfect sacrifice to bring in the presence of God. He gave us messianic psalms and he gave us prophets who told us Isaiah 53, 3, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray and each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Jesus said in John 5, 39, you search the scriptures, Pharisees, because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it's these that bear witness of me. This whole Bible's been telling us about a righteousness that would come by, by grace through faith. The Old Testament did not show them how to achieve righteousness. It pointed them to Christ. The righteousness that would be manifested, but now, that came into the world. Jeremiah 23, In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called. The Lord, our righteousness. Isaiah 45 says his righteousness will extend to the ends of the earth. This is what they've been waiting for. The whole Old Testament's been telling you this is what would come. So I want you to see then the righteousness of God has been revealed. And now secondly, your second point this morning is that this righteousness, I want you to hear this, comes by faith. Look with me in verse 22. Even the God kind of righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. There's no distinction. That's great, Paul. God kind of righteousness has been revealed apart from the works of the law, but my mouth is shut. Whatever requirement God gives for me to do to get righteousness that I need so desperately, I will fail. It'll just be another blown covenant. It won't accomplish salvation with this guy. So I want you to hear this this morning clearly. It's a covenant of grace. And we're going to look at that in the weeks ahead. God does all the righteousness. All of it. And He freely offers it to us apart from the works of the law. I love this Gospel. This Gospel, this righteousness is universally available and accessible. All the righteousness necessary in this covenant was done by Jesus Christ. All the transgressions of the law were paid for on a cross by Him. And now this gift of God is received by faith alone in Christ Jesus. Salvation is no longer found in a system, a temple with ceremonies and law-keeping. It's found in the person of Jesus Christ by faith. It's not just a general faith. All faith saves. No, it doesn't. It's not just faith that there's a creator. 
It's faith in Jesus Christ alone and what He has done and what we will look at in the next few weeks. There's no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved. It's the only entry point into the kingdom of God. God demands perfect righteousness. There's no other way in but the perfect righteousness that He gives in Jesus Christ. Redemption. Propitiation. It's all found in Him. And so hear this. Faith has no power. <clears throat> it's utter weakness to attain your own weakness, your righteousness. It's looking to His work and His strength and His righteousness. Faith has no merit. Nothing you can do. And it reaches out to God's remedy and His Son. Nothing in my hands I bring. Do you get that? Simply to thy cross I cling. A simple, single looking to Christ alone. This righteousness is available through Him alone. And faith is there's a knowledge of these truths that we're looking at, and I assent to them, but it has the idea of I trust. I give my life. It's not enough to sit here this morning and agree with all of Martin Luther said, and I agree with every one of the Reformation solas. I agree. Faith is, I agree, and I give my life to this. I sit here this morning by the grace of God, righteous. You can't just say, yeah, but now I'm going to go clean my life up enough so that I can get this righteousness. It's the opposite of this gospel. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. It's a faith that says this is mine. God said it. I hold out my empty hand. I receive. I sit here right now perfectly righteous before God. This righteousness He wants to give. And it's not add faith in your works to get it. So to receive it. Some of you sit here week after week and you will not receive it. You will not entrust that this is mine. That's how God looks at me right now. You're still thinking I got to do more. I got to go to church more, read my Bible more and be a better person. And you're still not having true faith. <coughs> Allergies and yelling are not a marriage made in heaven. I love this gospel. This gospel is this righteousness is available. And it's all done by Christ. And so it's by faith alone. Knowledge, assent, and trust. I want you to lean on it. And to believe it and say, even my sins were forgiven. And it's very redundant. If you look at verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Verse 28, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And I have people say, I wish Paul would have just said it clearly. Stop! It's redundant because we fight this. We always want to add something. We want to bring something. Nothing's free in this world. For those who believe, for those who have faith, you're justified apart from the works of the law by faith, by faith. I got nothing. I open my hand to this Christ and I receive everything. Nothing in me. All of Him. And that's why you need Romans 1-3 through 3 to shut your mouth to looking to anything in you. I'm telling you, still looking to your righteousness, saying you're too bad, is self-righteous. I'm not good enough for this. You're still thinking if you were good enough, God would justify you. Be done with it. Be dead. Faith alone. You get this righteousness that God gives by grace through faith. Last point. This righteousness has been revealed. It's a righteousness that comes by faith. And it's a righteousness that's necessary for everyone. Look at me in verse 22. There's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I reserve the right to come back to this verse. We're going to finish this section and I'm going to come back to verse 23 to tie it all together. But all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I want you to hear this this morning. The broadness of this offer this righteousness that God wants to give 
A salvation that can actually bring justification where you stand right before God. It's for all. There's no exclusion of race. There's no exclusion to your upbringing. There's no exclusion to your morality. There's no exclusion to your education. If your dad spent 40 years in prison or 40 years as a missionary, there's no exclusion. If you're raised by a Satanist or pastor, it's to all. The terms are the same to all. There's no distinction with our God. It's an equal opportunity righteousness. Empty-handed sinners who look to Christ alone receive this righteousness. Take it to the nations. Go tell everybody. It's, it's just, there's no limitations. Anyone who will hold out an empty hand and look to God in Christ, He will give this gift to. There's nothing in me or anything that must come out of me. It's all in Him. Believe this Gospel. There's no discrimination with God. It's for all. Romans 3.9, we're all under sin. We're all under dominion. Jew and Gentile, we're all a white hot mess. We're all under sin. We're all under judgment. We're equal in that. Just a bunch of equal people under the wrath of God. We're all in the same boat. There's no distinction. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so He is universally needed and He is universally available. Let that do something to your heart. Faith brings nothing and it receives everything in Jesus Christ. All the hurt and pain in our land by distinctions. I love to look at a glorious Gospel with no distinctions. And when you see this, you become a debtor to all men, Jew or Greek, barbarians. You now have a love for all. And it's a gospel for all. And a God for all. May we be a church unified in this. And moving toward needs. And weep with those who meet, weep. And tell all men and women and children of the righteousness of God. That is available by faith. That's why we exist. And we're not going to be moved away from that and we're not going to lose our focus. It's a glorious gospel. There's a righteousness manifested apart from the law. That's received by faith. Finally, something we can do. Nothing. Nothing. We're going to see in Romans 9-11 through that faith is even a gift of God. That's the Gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're an unbeliever, here this morning, I'm going to ask you, do you have a but now? There's a but now in history, but is there a but now in your life? That once, whenever someone tells me I've always been a Christian, that can't be. You're born under sin. And you're born under condemnation. And has there been a but now where you've gone from works and merit and trying to earn God's favor, living under the dominion of sin? Is there a but now that you've come to see the beauty of what I'm talking about? And it's overtaken your mind and your heart and your life and your soul. And there's a but now that's changed everything about you. Or is it just some little thing up here? Do you have a but now where the righteousness of Christ has finally overtaken your whole life? This is a free gift and I'm done trying to merit and work and receive. I just have received the free grace of God in Jesus Christ. Is there a but now? Don't die with just mental ascent. Do you have a but now? And for our dear believers, so few who really live into this reality. I meet so few people who really live into this truth. We always get saved and the enemy is so crafty that he always brings works back into our foundation, our justification, our acceptance with God. And we start looking at all the places I come short 
the more I fall. And, and you start thinking somehow you're going to start having a righteousness that accept, makes you acceptable to God by your works, and you're, you're never going to get there. You're going to have to die looking to his righteousness alone because yours is always not going to be enough. And how many still sit here, sitting here with no peace, no resting because you're still looking at your works. <coughs> You've been led back under the law. Paul says, don't be subject to a yoke of slavery again. Stand firm in your freedom that you have an alien righteousness that's been given to you by God in Christ. And those who live in this, Paul said, will bear the fruit of the Spirit. And when you finally just keep living in this gospel and getting it, you know what's going to come out? Love, the fulfillment of the law, joy and peace, and patience and goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. Law can't produce this. Only a gospel that gives you a righteousness apart from the law received will begin to bear the fruit of God. And I'm just crying and asking for the believers to live in to the righteousness that God has given that He's just as happy with you this morning. He, just, he delights over you because you are now clothed in an alien righteousness, not your own. This could change your life if you just believe it. By faith. This gospel. For Christ is the end of the law. For righteousness to everyone who believes. Romans 10.4 And so I pray that there is a, a but now. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. But now there's a new way of righteousness that's been done. It's given to me by faith alone. Are you done trying to be justified by works and effort? Because the church is jammed full of this. And the world, the flesh, and the devil, and well-meaning pastors will keep getting you to your acceptance by performance. As we close, I just want you to stare at the gospel this morning because it's so good. I would that all of you would have a God kind of righteousness this morning because it's the absolute best. And, and I feel like having an altar call. Thomas, do you know just as I am? Where is he? I'm not going to do that. But I am going to call you. If you've never seen this righteousness, and you're the one in the church still trying to perform to get God's love, I'm going to ask you in the quietness of your heart, the wind blowing out here this morning, to surrender to Jesus Christ, to look away from anything in you. No resolutions, what you're going to fix. And I want you just to look your eyes out at the one hanging in your place on a cross, bowing his head, saying, it is finished. They tell us die. The righteousness of God is complete. And I want to invite you by faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Let's pray. Father, what a gospel. What a gospel. And I pray that everyone sitting here this morning or on live stream, God, that there would be no one who would look for any other way to be right with you than this righteousness that's been manifested apart from law and that was promised through the law and the prophets. God, it's by faith. There's no distinction. No one can say I'm too bad or too good this morning. It's the gospel for all. And any who need it, let him call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and be saved. And God, I pray for my brothers and sisters who have put themselves back under the law, who are just despairing this morning because they're looking at their own belly. They're navel-gazing. They're looking at their own righteousness like it's going to make them acceptable to you. God, let them lift their eyes and look again at Jesus Christ and find healing and not be under the yoke of slavery. Let them come out and find the freedom of the sons of God that faith will work through love. God, please work mightily in all of our hearts this morning and, and do individually with each heart what needs to be done. God, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious, beautiful name that we do pray. Amen.